welcome to all of you gathering with us today. Thank you. We see you showing up in the attendee screen. It is great to get to have such a wonderful group with us today. Uh, my name is Catherine Smith, and I serve as Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives at Duke Divinity School. Um, it is my joy to get to introduce first my colleague, Norbert Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson is Professor of Food, Economics, and Community at Duke Divinity School, and newly announced as the Director of the World Food Policy Program at Duke University. And he is here to bring us greetings on behalf of Duke. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and welcome everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here with you uh, and welcome you on behalf of the community of the Duke Divinity School. Um, the faith and fitness uh, gathering, thinking about spiritual leaders and, and your needs. We all know that the last few years have been really challenging, particularly for faith community leaders. And we are so appreciative of your work but we also recognize it is critical that you do the things that allow you to take care of yourself. So I welcome you on behalf of the Duke Divinity School and wish you a great uh, session. Thanks so Dr. much. Smith. Appreciate that. And, um, and bringing us greetings from our wonderful partner in this work. We're so grateful for Church Mutual Insurance is Pam Stampin, who is Senior Vice President at Church Mutual and their Chief People Officer. So welcome, Pam. Great. Thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Norbert, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Pam Stampin, the Chief People Officer with Church Mutual, and I feel so blessed to be with you today and to welcome you on behalf of Church Mutual to the Duke University Divinity School Faith and Fitness Webinar. Um, our mission at Church Mutual is to protect the greater good and to improve the human condition, and we do this through the products that we offer and the organizations that we serve. And we feel that we are achieving our purpose when we're helping support you as leaders of faith and your organizations fulfill your purpose. Now, you know better than anyone that as leaders of faith and caregivers and stewards, you have chosen a life of service. And while a life of service can be very fulfilling on many levels, you also know better than anyone how demanding it can be in other ways. As spiritual leaders, you also know that you've been asked to carry sometimes the burdens of others and they become your cares as well. Taking time for yourself, taking a moment for pause or a walk or to prepare a healthy meal or to care for yourself physically can often get put on the back burner of your lives when you're in the service of your calling. But when we think about it, if we neglect our physical health, it impedes our ability to bring our full spiritual selves to our work and to others. So I, sometimes you probably feel exhausted or stuck in a habit of inactivity or maybe even a little stress eating, or maybe you have big goals on the positive side that you wanna change your health this year and you just need a bit of motivation to take action. If so, I can guarantee you that you have turned into the right conversation. I'm so excited about the topics to be shared with you today by Dr. Greg Allison and Dr. Joseph Spears. I am confident that their messages are going to inspire all of us and encourage us as listeners and learners by their fresh perspectives and the value that they will share about connecting the body and the mind and the spirit in practical ways so we can take care of our bodies so we can be the best we can be in all our service. Thank you again to all of you who are attending today. Thank you from all of us at Church Mutual and we hope you all enjoy the session today. Thank you so much, Pam. And thank you to all of the partners at Church Mutual for this wonderful and important work. So let me say a bit about how today's session will go. Um, each of our panelists will have about 10 to 12 minutes to talk on the subject, and then we'll have plenty of time, hopefully for some Q and A. So if you have a question that comes to mind, either through something that one of our panelists has said, or just something that you bring with you into this space as we talk about faith and fitness, we invite you to enter those questions into the Q&A function on the webinar chat. Some of you have found that space already, and we'll do our very best to try to cover as many of those questions as we're able to in the time ahead. 
It is my privilege to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Greg Allison, who is a professor of Christian theology at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and also serves as secretary of the Evangelical Theological Society. Thank you so much, Dr. Allison, for being with us, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Welcome all to our webinar. I'm very privileged and excited uh, to address you uh, this afternoon. Uh, my thesis is this, the proper state of human existence is embodiment. As God's unique image bears, we are designed to be embodied human beings. Thus, I affirm the statement, I am my body. Note, I'm not saying I am only my body. Most, if not all of us, would deny that statement holding to some type of dualism. Human beings are soul body composites. Whereas materialists hold that we are merely our body. And whereas idealists hold that we are merely our soul or spirit. Dualists like me hold that we are complex human beings consisting of both an immaterial aspect and a material aspect, a soul body unity a psychosomatic or hylomorphic unity. But for our purposes today, focusing on health, I emphasize, I am my body. Indeed, as someone has offered, without this body, I do not exist. And I am myself as my body. Accordingly, I move away from an instrumentalist view of the body. That is, our body is a gift that we use and steward, like we use and steward our time, money, resources, and abilities. Expressions of such an instrumentalist view of embodiment include, I am thankful for God's gift of my body. I encourage others to thoughtfully steward their body. I need to care for my body in ways similar to how I schedule regular tune-ups for my car and change out its battery when its power is diminishing. Frederica Matthews Green offers, the initial impression that we stand critically apart from our bodies was our first mistake. We are not merely passengers riding around in skin-tight race cars. We are our bodies. They embody us. In agreement with Matthews Green, I fear that an instrumentalist view of our embodiment distances us from our body. Thus, I observe my body as something external to the real I. But as embodied human beings, I am the acting subject, the agent of all my decisions and actions, all of which are necessarily rooted in my embodiment. So why do we have this very common view of our embodiment? Historically, Gnosticism, the elevation of the immaterial or spiritual aspect of human nature over the material or bodily aspect of human nature, this Gnosticism has historically infected and continues to infect the church today some contemporary manifestations of this philosophy are, some people consider the body to be inherently evil. They despise their bodies and dismiss the idea of exercise, proper nutrition, rest and sleep, and so forth. Any time, effort, and resources spent on bodily matters is just a waste of time. Other people, while not denigrating the body, will diminish its importance. Some may even consider the body as good, but not as good as the soul. So they spend their time pursuing spiritual disciplines while viewing physical disciplines as serving only an instrumentalist purpose, that is to keep their body functioning well so they can engage in more important matters of spiritual growth, which is unrelated to their body. Still others imagine that human embodiment is a mistake. 
For example, C.S. Lewis quipped, the fact that we have bodies is the oldest joke there is. The philosophy of Gnosticism has pushed the church in the direction of viewing sin as primarily something that infects our soul, our attitudes, motivations, purposing, and so forth. Because of my emphasis on embodiment, I underscore the physicality of sin with special reference to three of the seven deadly sins, gluttony, sloth, and lust. Let's take the first as an example. As someone has defined it, gluttony is the immoderate consumption of food arising from the unchecked appetite for something more than or other than what God has provided and is therefore judged a sin. Gluttony in its primary sense then is the overconsumption of food. The clergy in my own denomination has the infamous distinction of being the most morbidly obese of all clergy. At church potlucks, fried foods, ample portions, and the insistence that the pastor has to finish all the leftover food results in obesity and its many tragic consequences. Scripture considers gluttony to be a sin, and gluttony has historically been listed as one of the seven deadly sins. But my denomination has fallen prey to the notion that sin has to do primarily with the soul and thus fails to see the physical overconsumption of food as a sin. Given this view of embodiment, I affirm that sanctification, the progressive movement toward maturity or holiness, must be holistic and thus mindful of our embodiment. Thus, I emphasize the importance of proper nutrition, regular exercise, sound sleep, and periodic rest and retreat. These elements of sanctification are very different from the traditional classical means of progressing in holiness, such as reading and meditating on scripture, prayer, corporate worship, service, and the like. And all of these are means are essential to holistic sanctification. As I see it, my emphasis on matters like nutrition and exercise flows from my theology of human embodiment in the following way. One, as embodied people, care for our body is important for as long as we are in this earthly existence. This point is just what we would expect, 1A, if the proper state of human existence is embodiment, and 1B, if an essential given of human life is embodiment, and 1C, if the triune God dwells in, un, in our embodied selves by means of the Holy Spirit, whose temple we are, and 1D, if at the return of Christ, the Holy Spirit will re-embody us with our glorified resurrected body, 1E, then we would expect that it is proper for us to live as disciplined embodied believers, caring for our embodied selves through proper nutrition, regular exercise, sound sleep, and periodic rest. Thus, too, and I conclude with this, embodiment is the proper state of human existence, so I embrace sanctification that includes physical discipline for embodied wellness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Allison. Really helpful to have a deep uh, theological grounding of how we understand our bodies and all the ways that they show up in the world and certainly in the ways that underscore how we think about this topic of fitness. What does it mean to relate our faith to questions of fitness? So we really appreciate that. We'll turn now to our second panelist, uh, Dr. Joseph Spears, who is professor and department chair of sport management at North Greenville University. We're so grateful to have you here with us, Dr. Spears, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to, to serve and be a part of this wonderful uh, experience. And, you know, I was thinking, 
uh, as I considered the audience. Um, and so many of us are athletes and we're, you, we're fit, we're very uh, active, but what about the population of people who, who uh, do not have the opportunity or had not had the opportunity or discipline uh, to have been a part of a fitness lifestyle all of their life? Um, but I believe that uh, that person has an advantage um, by way of their faith. And uh, what is this link between faith and fitness? Um, because there are many that uh, have a level of faith, and there are many that don't practice a level of faith, but yet there's still power uh, that we can identify within ourselves that will give us that hot spot uh, to initiate um, a, a more healthier, fulfilled lifestyle. Um, and for those who practice faith, the book of Genesis in the beginning gives us a strong foundation to help us to ignite and to initiate something um, that will impact us and uh, allow us to lead the healthy life uh, that I believe that God has destined for each and every one of us to do. Um, in the book of Genesis chapter one, I mean, chapter two, I think it starts in the beginning, uh, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, it says, and God formed man from the dust of the ground. And that dust represents the physical body. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, uh, breath representing spirit. And then it said, man became a living soul. That's wonderful because right there, we were created for those who believe a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Now that's, that's dynamic. That's, that's something that we need. We can take that and we can initiate an impact and change our life and move into a more healthier lifestyle. Well, what do you mean? Well, the physical body we all know represents the seat of our senses, it's five. What we see, touch, taste, feel, and hear. The soul, according to Bertram, uh, in Life and Health, said it is the seat of our emotions, uh, our mind, our will, our imagination, and our emotions and intellect. And for those of us who are believers, uh, we take a different position as it relates to what the spirit means to us. But I believe that those who have um, a level of commitment to say, hey, I want to live a more healthier life, can allow that spiritual aspect of your life to take predominance over your soulless realm, your mind, having a renewed mind. And the Apostle Paul talks about this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Allowing that spirit to take predominance over the seat of your emotion, a new mind, a new will, a new imagination, a new emotions and intellect. So we're bringing that soul in alignment with what God is destined for us to do in the earth, whether we're pastors, ministers, evangelists, missionaries. We're, we're capturing the vision and purpose of God. And for those who don't believe, it's a hot spot there. But we're allowing that spirit to take predominance over the soul and ultimately our physical body is the manifestation of what's happening on the inside of us. Uh, you know, um, um, I'm reminded of a friend who always had those four to five quick starts. And I'm thought, uh, you know, fast starts, false starts. I mean, I believe many of us may have had that opportunity where we, where we set a plan for better, a better life, a better fit life. You know, we're going to do this. We can intellectually lay it out but the problem is, is keeping it and maintaining it. Uh, I just believe that that strong belief can serve as the key to unlock that doorway to a better life. That strong spiritual connection. What is it that God has called you to do? You're passionate about it. And we got to be able to connect what we believe that God is destined for us to do in the spirit realm and allow that revelation to take predominance over the soul. Your entire mind is renewed, your soulless realm. And ultimately, you'll begin to manifest, um, you know, and come in alignment, ultimately, what uh, 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 God is, um, um, has, has destined for you to do in the earth. Um, you, know, you know, I know that there's some lack of motivation can ultimately be a challenge for many people, but, but I believe whether you are a believer, you classify yourself as a Christian, you find that hot spot 
and you ultimately realize that your physical condition was not only a reflection of your hot spot in your spiritual connection, but would also allow you to live within the principles uh, of what you believe your belief system is. You know, bring in your belief system, your physical body and your physical attributes in alignment with what your belief system is. And, um, you know, I just think that this is a practice that would allow us to get started and wake up every morning, you know, uh, with a new zeal, a new perspective, being able to capture what God is revealing in the spirit realm and manifesting that in the soulish area and ultimately possessing it in the physical world. And I think that's real simple and very easy for a lot of us because we're spiritual giants. Now, how do we make that connection in the spirit realm and become, and then uh, let, 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 let that spirit, let, let the spirit become the new sheriff in town, in other words. And our mind is a reflection of what's happening in the spirit. Our will is redirected spiritually. Our imagination now is a reflection of what's happening in the spirit realm. And then ultimately it manifests itself in the physical world. So weight loss doesn't happen immediately. Being able to run a 10K may not happen uh, in 30 days. But as we begin to uh, as we begin to practice and begin to uh, uh, stay focused in, as it relates to what God is revealing, and he's revealed so much to many of us that are here today, we just want to be able to make that connection and allow our life, our physical life, to be healthy enough um, as it relates to what God is revealing for us, because God wouldn't send you to the mission field sick. So we got to see what that looks like. And I'm looking forward to being able to share more of this as we move forward in the next part of our program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Spears. I really appreciate it to both of our panelists. This is a, there's a lot here to start with, and I'm really excited. To, it gives us plenty of time for questions today. And so those of you that are um, listening in today, please feel free to use that Q&A function now to send questions you might have for our panelists. I'll say um, one of the things I'm mindful of that both of you have alluded to is all of us come into this space in different spaces. Some of us are asking these questions as newbies, newcomers to it. And we're, we're trying to maybe just start on the practice of habits and practices that honor our theological commitments and um, help us learn to be in and with our bodies. Some of us, uh, some may have been on the road for a long time, but need that continual re renewal about what it is that motivates us? What is the guiding principle? What are the things that help to inform our imagination for around faith and fitness? Um, I'm also mindful that those of us on this call come from a lot of different spaces theologically in a lot of different traditions. And, um, and some of that, you know, is for the fact that we may have some Christians on this call and not. And I appreciate our, we had a question in the chat to that regard. I'll say I'm mindful that um, one of the distinctiveness of the Abrahamic traditions and uh, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, is they do all place a premium on embodiment and an understanding of the ways that bodies are made by God in the world with dignity and honor and that they are made in the image of God. So um, Dr. Allison, maybe I'll start with you. How might you uh, think about this question of, I am my body, or I'm not only my body, but I am my body within the lens of this larger Abrahamic tradition? I agree with what you've just said that uh, this Abrahamic tradition and all of its permutations does agree that uh, um, God, however we conceive God, has uh, created a realm of beings, human beings, to be embodied. Uh, some with various faith traditions would maintain there's another realm of beings, angelic beings that are not embodied, but immaterial, but uh, human beings, God has created as embodied human beings. And as you mentioned, I think we all would agree, there's something there in terms of image bearing of God. So following up on Dr. Spears reference to Genesis 2, Genesis 1, uh, so, so God purposes to create uh, beings who would uh, exercise dominion over what God has created. And so God creates 
human beings in his image, male and female, and then he gives them responsibility. We often call Genesis 128 the cultural mandate, uh, building society. And the only way we can carry out this mandate uh, in an earthly realm is that we are embodied. And so I think all of us would agree essential to who we are as human beings is by divine design and creation embodiment. Thank you so much for response. I appreciate this. Um, the next question I have, I might direct your way, Dr. Spears, uh, and realizing that none of us here are physicians or trying to be, but also speaking out of the spaces that we do inhabit. Um, John in the chat said, you know, he's struggling with chronic sinus problems and that makes it, that can leave uh, feelings of exhaustion, sluggishness. It makes getting the things done that have to get done nearly impossible, right? This is about all to manage and in that kind of space, trying to get the exercise you need might be a little bit, feels like too much. How do we think about the decisions of when to push through again, like what choices we make about when we push, how we listen to our bodies uh, and who we listen to in advising us about the choices we make with our bodies? You know, I, I, um, I believe we possess a natural inner power um, to really promote the healing process. Um, and uh, spiritually, you know, we, we have that um, discernment to know when to move. And, and a lot of that comes for those who are runners and, and athletes. You know, some of the things you just, you endure and you keep going and some of the things you're able to listen to. Um, but our minds have been really endowed with an incredible capacity to affect our functioning and our overall health of our body. You know, when the Apostle Paul even talks about that, let this mind be in you. Because when we, because as a believer, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have the mind of Christ and then we have a natural mind. So the Apostle Paul encourages us that we need the mind of Christ because that mind endows us with, some incre with an incredible capacity, you know, to, to overcome to listen, uh, to hear from uh, that hot spot from within us or, or that spiritual relationship that we have. Let me give you an example. You know, when stress overwhelms us, our emotions and bodies break down. But when we develop an effective strategies, our capacities to work begins to increase. You know, having that renewed mind, I think I'm reminded in another place in the book of Romans, I, 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 we can track this in either direction, but Paul, uh, 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 Romans talks about be uh, transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind, because there's some things that God wants to do in your life as a believer that we'll never be able to accomplish it unless, we're, unless we allow what he's revealing to us from within to be manifested in the physical world, and that's through our physical bodies. That's the way he moves in the earth. Um, and when we're committed to that, uh, when we're committed to that process, we then have the capacity to hear the spirit and be sensitive to the things of God. Some of us, I'm gonna tell you something, for those who are avid runners, uh, whether you're a runner, you, you, you do yoga or whatever, I mean, you don't wanna, you know, some of us on a run, we go to meetings on that run. We go to counseling sessions, prayer time, so uh, when we get back and we get finished, man, we're, we're ready to rock and roll. We're ready to fulfill what we believe God is destined for us. Uh, I think King David had a, David had a, um, he wrote something, uh, uh, it's been over 300 years ago, and I just want to shut down on this one here, just in, uh, in, in it was in Psalms 32, uh, Psalms 32, three and four. And, and he said something, I think would be a good closer here. He said, when I, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For the day and night, thou hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of the summer. You know, so it's important, uh, you know, that he talked about keeping solid and, and how it waxed his bones because he did not take the initiation you know, to, to tap into what God was revealing to him in the spirit realm. 
And as a result of that, you know, because he wasn't hearing and he didn't make that connection, um, he had an outcome that he didn't appreciate and want it. So uh, may, may I add something to that? In, in total agreement with Dr. Spears, one addition would be we don't have to do this alone, right? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Spears rightfully has emphasized this idea of the spirit, the mind, the will uh, working together manifested in our embodiment, but we're encouraged, right? We, we run the race not alone, but we've got trainers and mentors, right, who push us and remind us to listen as he was talking about so we're not designed to do it individually in isolation. I'm so thankful for a faith community that encourages me uh, when I'm uh, weak and when i am uh, got that broken body, they can come alongside of me and encourage me, exhort me. Thanks to both of you. Um, I wanna follow up on a thread that I'm hearing a bit in the chat. Both of you alluded in your presentations to um, a, what is potentially a kind of a dualism of body and soul or body and spirit. And in some cases, the language of soul and spirit. We have some question in the chat about is soul and spirit used interchangeably in that sense? Are they synonymous? And then also, how do we think about these kinds of definitions or language as a, an intact embodied whole? You know, that we are uh, one being. I, I even think about this uh, when we talk about a tr in the you know at least in the Christian tradition, right? A triune God, a three in one, or in, um, in the Jewish tradition, one God. How we so how do we think about being embodied as body, soul, and spirit? And again, is that spirit and soul synonymous? I'm going to take a I'm going to take a shot at the first part, and I'll leave the second part for Dr. Allison. Um, you know, when we talk about spirit and and soul. Um, the spirit represents to many of us that we can, all of us here can give interpretation to that. The, the soul is sort of like, if I can say, uh, like a goat. It's hard to catch and hard to kill when you look at the seat of the emotions. The spirit realm, the soul acts sort of like, I can say, a transmitter, uh, a mediator between what God is revealing to the physical body. The soul either can accept or reject it. Uh, God reveals something to you in the spirit realm, in in in, and then he he's trying to manifest it into the soulless realm. And if and, and if our soul has not, if the spirit has not been predominant in the soulless area, your mind, your will, your imagination, your emotions and intellect, your soul can either reject it or receive it. God is revealing newness of life and ways to become more healthier and, and to meet those um, ailments that you're facing in the physical world. So the soul can either receive it or reject it, but it becomes sort of like a switchboard um, to receive what God is saying. That's why the apostle Paul said it's, it's, it's important. I think, I think in, in my closing, I think here as a believer, it's easy to attend church. It's easy to associate yourself um, with the title, but I think the I think the most courageous thing to do in order to address that first question is to lose your mind in order to in order for you to gain the mind of Christ. Lose that mind that's in the soulless realm so that you can have His mind. So the second aspect of that question: How do we come into this? Uh notion of we're intact. Um, again, I'll go back to Genesis 1. So as God purposes to create human beings, right, there, there's, he, he designs to create this realm of beings in his image, Genesis 1, 26. Verse 27 then is the actualization of that purpose. So God creates human beings in his image as men and women. Um, and so if we uh, could go into space travel and, and go back and look and see what results from this divine creative act, it would be uh, female gendered embodied image bearers and uh, male gendered embodied image bearers, right? We are embodied. And, and so um, we, we appear on the scene uh, after God's uh, creative work as intact human beings. So that would be why I focus on this. And, and Dr. Spears has wonderfully laid this out. There, there's parts of us, there's aspects of us, material, immaterial, physical, uh, spiritual, 
but we are a unified whole. Thank you so much to both of you for that question. I appreciate that. Um, this next question, Dr. Spears, is aimed at you. Uh, Darlene was hoping that you could elaborate on maintenance on the fitness and faith journey. Maintenance? Yeah, thinking of, I'm, I'm guessing that Darlene, thinking about how do we maintain, um, how do we how do we stick with maybe plans that we said? How do we think about being steady in it? This related to some other yeah. questions in our chat, right? Which is, yeah. what happens when I get that craving? What happens when the pattern disrupted? Yeah. What happens when I, you know, something happens and I got to take weeks yeah. off? You know, how do we think about staying on the journey? You know, I, I, I think, I think launching, I think, I think this, this effort is, is very innovative, innovative. You know, the relationship between Duke Divinity and Church Mutual um in just the gathering of those who are present today because we know how to plan um we know how to be effective we know how to strategize and we know how to uh and and the most exciting thing is to be able to get that revelation from the spirit realm tapping the spirit in in soul and physical body to develop a realistic plan a realistic plan Myself, I've been I've been a runner all my life, and many of us who, uh, um, you know, who who had that level of physical commitment. If I'm a new believer or a new person who's who's launching this physical fitness program, I want to be realistic in my approach. I don't want to be able to uh, set a plan that's relevant to someone who's been fit all of their lives. I want to do something uh, simple that I can maintain, whether it's one day a week or it's three days a week, because I'm not looking for results. I'm looking for a renewed mind. I'm looking to, to uh, um, I'm looking to um, 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 be transformed in my thinking, because if I can change the way I think, I can change the way I live, and I can begin to take on more responsibility. So that's, that's, that's being realistic, to be patient, to be relevant to where you are, and whatever you're hearing from someone else, make sure that you're hearing something that's relevant to your own journey and your own process. And being able to hear from, the, from that hot spot within you that you're doing something that, that you can commit to. Because remember, consistency is more effective than, than inconsistency. You know, you want to be repetitious in what you're doing and being able to wait on those results. Uh, so I think that's I think that's very very important. Uh, once we gain the knowledge of of this process, and then we gain the insight and strength to have the patience to see it through. Because I'm going to tell you something. Don't let no one. I believe that we, there will become a day, you know, where we can say something and believe it, and all of a sudden, um, you know, it happens the next day. But getting fit is not like going to McDonald's, you know. You place your order at one one and you pick it up at the next one. It's going to require, you know, uh, consistency, commitment, determination, and fight into being able to connect it to what God is revealing to you in the spirit realm. I think, I think what helped me is thinking that I'll never be able to fulfill what God is revealing to me to do academically if I'm not physically fit. And that kind of motivated me when I started making those alignments. So being able to align your fitness life with some other personal goals and passionate goals that you have in your life and placing fitness a little bit more higher than that. Uh, that, that, that process, um, you know, kind of worked for me. That is so helpful. Thank you. And I really appreciate how beautifully that ties in Dr. Allison with your point about, you don't have to do it alone. Sometimes the hardest part, especially if you're just getting started, is you might be self-conscious about having a community around you, right? You might be nervous about what they're going to think or what will they expect. Um, but to realize that part of the gift of being in a community, particularly the gift that we can be to one another as parts of faith communities, is to have uh, people who are going to love us and be alongside us where we're, wherever we are in that journey. So I appreciate that. We've talked a bit about individuals in particular. How do we think about ourselves as individual beings created by God? But question for both of you. How can faith leaders use their influence to create a culture of health and wellness? And Dr. Allison, would you want to start with that one? Uh, yes, uh, excellent question. How do faith leaders cultivate a, a culture, a faith community? I think first and foremost, they have to be leading stellar examples 
of a commitment to fitness and a regular uh, program of fitness. They can't just talk about it or exhort their faith community to do it. Um, people will be asking, okay, you're telling me to do it, you're encouraging me to do it, but I don't see it in your life, right? So I would say for our the leaders of our faith communities, they need to be stellar examples. That does not mean that they don't fail, right? They're stellar, but they still stumble, right? And so it may be the case, even among our faith leaders in this area of creating a culture of fitness, that they make two steps forward and three steps backward. But then they tell us, members of the faith community, I'm two steps forward, but three steps backward. And I go, I can relate to that because that's exactly what happened to me this week, right? And then I think they help encourage us to set, as Dr. Spear said, realistic expectations. You're not going to be able to run a half marathon in a month. And so uh, set realistic expectations. And I think let's have a training partner, right? Running partner, I, I'm a swimmer. I, I swim with someone all the time that exhorts me, that pushes me. And then just pausing before we swim for a, a moment of silence or prayer, whatever would be uh, appropriate for us as, as uh, people of, of faith, whatever that is, so that we're not doing it alone. We don't have to become exhausted and dependent just on ourselves. We're, we're encouraged and pushed. And also when we fail, we're, we're picked up and said, it's okay, two steps forward, three steps back. That, that, that often happens. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Spears, would you care to respond? Yeah, just, just simply, I think just what we're doing now, um, being able to partnership with uh, local stakeholders within your community and allowing your place of faith to become um, a, a, a place where uh, resources are made available along these lines. As a leader, as a faith leader, I want to partner with uh, Church Mutual Insurance. I would want to partner with uh, Regina at Duke Divinity School because these individuals are actually speaking and singing the same tunes that I need to implement in my local ministry. So I want to, if, I, if I'm personally at the preliminary stages, I want to partner with people who are actually, who can render that level of support, not just to uh, my constituents and my members, but also to provide me and allow me to become more informed of the resources that are available to myself and my congregation. Those are lovely responses. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit to imagine what it means to be a person of faith and to navigate embodiment in the world that we live in. And we think about that uh, along the lines of what are cultural norms, what are uh, particularly in, for most of us, our social location, what are Western norms? How do we think about faith and fitness in the sense that God has made all these bodies and they come all different ways and shapes and sizes, and they come with varying degrees of um, differences and abilities and strengths. And um, how do we think about the spirit, mind, body alignment that helps with spiritual health and to imagine God makes bodies in all different ways, right? As people of faith, how do we navigate that sometimes over and against the prevailing culture? I would just uh, personally respond by talking about my own faith community, which is a multi-ethnic, multicultural faith community, um, reflective of the demographic of the neighborhood in which we exist, that reminds me every time we gather together that God has a remarkable and beautiful spectrum of embodied image bearers, right? And I see it played out all the time. And that to me is a great encouragement just to resist this tendency to homogeneity and just meeting with people that look like and talk like and are like us and saying, the world in which God has created as image bearers and places image bearers as this is this beautiful, uh, large spectrum. And I, and I want my faith community, and I have one that reflects that reality. It reminds me all the time. Thank you. Dr. Spears, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, just briefly, I think in um, 
um, Timothy, First Timothy in uh, chapter four, verse eight says, for bodily exercise profited uh, little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of this life that now is in that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exceptions. You know, I, I think um, that kind of lays the foundation sort of um, with a belief. I think having that belief, uh, which is definitely necessary required, is definitely required for any fitness conversion. It involves like a, a conviction, having that conviction, having to understand the spirit, soul, and body in, in those connections, but allowing that conviction about your body and health um, that would that should be an outgrowth uh, of your really your whole spiritual worldview becomes effective. And um, you know, any 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 physical conditionings must be kept subordinate. To the spirit and what's being revealed at that realm you know because that's where the manifestation that's where we can persevere we can win you know um, any athlete any runner um, um, you know um, can get to a place of fatigue but still able to go to the next level because who we are is not a manifestation of what we see who we really are is what's being revealed in the spirit realm so as a runner, as an athlete, as a pastor, as a, as a faith believer, my ultimate objective is to rise, is to raise my life and my people up to the, to the uh, highest level. And that highest level is the spiritual realm. Because if I can get the folks there, I can provide a level of necessary uh, endorphins that I would never receive in any race or any marathon or practice that I would go out on. So raising the stakes, and allowing the, the physical conditioning to be subordinate to the spirit. And, and our body should open the door to more, at this point now, to a more of a more deeper, more profound inner experiences. So our body becomes a reflection of something a whole lot more deeper. Um, and uh, you know, to you know, to you know, to get from to get from zero into a place where you are moving beyond the surface jargon. Now, I'm not just preaching and teaching, but now I become a manifestation of what God is doing in the lives of those who I've been called to serve. Um, you, know, uh, you know, your basic faith should require that you take, you take good care, um, you know, of your, of your uh, uh, physical body. Yeah. That's yep. Um, thank you to both of you. So um, this is a great question uh, from one of our participants. Do you have any examples, particularly of small or rural churches that engage pragmatically in promotion of physical wellness for people of various abilities? So one of our participants noted that there are sometimes few organizational resources that are available to communities, particularly if you're in a more rural area. So how we think about those that may have not as easy access to partnering organizations, this is sort of a follow-up to the question of faith leaders, maybe how churches can help um, to promote physical wellness. I wonder if the churches in a particular rural geographical area, one of those churches could take the initiative and say, we want to help form people of in our rural community uh, in, in wellness. And so we're going to take the lead. Uh, maybe we'll get uh, equipment, uh, we'll sponsor classes, we'll help train, we'll collaborate together. And so it's, it's, it's not each individual church, but one who takes a, a responsibility for it and leads, and then just lots of people participate in it. That may be a solution. Um, briefly, if I can just kind of um, think about, you know, how do we then, and how do we establish this all important connection between faith and uh, diet, uh, eating habits, and making this, bringing this, uh, these resources. And I think uh, to kind of piggyback a little off Dr. Allison without mentioning exactly what he said, he covered it. I, I think we, 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 we gather the minimum facts so you can make an intelligent decision about smart eating. Uh, being able to gather those facts 
and getting those resources, building those relationships within the community. I was just reading just in preparation here, according to a journal um, of the Arkansas Medical Society, it said ignorance about nutrition was directly related to poor food choices. Ignorance about, uh, uh, um, about nutrition. So people, people with less than a high school education never ate some of the essential items that this, this uh, report uh, uh, had, had indicated. Uh, but as age and income levels increased, there was an tendency to pick up or, or, or to pick low fat products. So I think building those relationships, becoming more informed, making those right choices. And so, 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 so I think the lesson is clear when we think about just some recommendations is that um, learn all you can about the amounts and types of foods that will maximize your health and fitness. And you do that by way, as Dr. Allison say, through relationships and partnerships. And then recognize that adjusting your eating habits to conform with what you are receiving. You know, what I'm receiving today, the information, the relationships, the uh, what's being made available to me now, I begin to make those adjustments with the support of that understanding of what I, who I am as spirit, soul, and body. Because you know, I think when you leave here, I, 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 I prophetically say when you leave here, you're going to leave with a wealth of information and resources because you're going to tap the spirit like you've never done before. No more are you going to start and finish or not have time. You know, I think, I think, I think if we can just picture it within our minds that I'm not, I don't want to preach from a hospital bed. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to preach in the pulpit and preach in the community. I want to preach with the lifestyle, the way I live, the choices I'm making. Absolutely. I love that response. I'm reminded too, and this is a little bit of a plug for our participants, um, Dr. Wilson's work, who was, who was with us earlier, that part of the challenge is communities that have difficult getting access and affordable access to the food that they need. So how ways that faith communities just, uh, to be thinking about ways that food, faith community can help to participate in making sure that there is accessible, affordable, good nutrition in your community. And sometimes that comes as building a community garden. Sometimes that comes with partnering with local organizations, but just realizing that oftentimes in rural communities, especially um, even food deserts can create and exacerbate some of the questions that you've just named, which I'm excited uh, just to uh, learn together how we can address those issues. Um, or Oh, do you have a final a word on that? I wanted to say, like, when you take, like, doctor, if I was a pastor in a community in North Carolina, and Dr. Wilson, I think, uh, over food and, uh, and theology, I would, my church, I would identify those who have that level of expertise, and we would partner with local universities and organizations and create that, that network to provide the resources that my local church may not have. Uh, to be able to make things happen and serve more effectively serve our community, you know, partner with experts like Dr. Wilson and other organizations, universities have funding available. Um, there are opportunities for uh, uh, that are outside of what's the scope of my own ministry that I can gain through stakeholder partnership. Absolutely. Uh, well, as our time is drawing to a close, I want to give each of you the chance for one last word. And here's my question to you. It's a, it's a really quick two-parter. The first is maybe what is one free resource if there's an app or a program that you use or you like, might recommend. And the second is, is there something that for you is a sort of guiding, whether it's a verse or a song or a phrase that animates you in your own practices of fitness? So last word for both of our panelists. I use an app called Way of Life and I track when I swim. So this is not the only motivation. Dr. Spears has pointed out the correct motivation, but a motivation for me is after I have done my swimming in the day, I open up my app and I check the box and that green box helps motivate me to swim the next day. So for me, that's very helpful. In terms of a word or phrase, again, I go back to how I began to consistently think of myself, I am my body, I am an embodied person. It, it means my embodiment. 
exercise, nutrition, rest, sleep is an essential part of my daily life. Thank you. I think for me is, is, the, is the understanding of spirit, soul, and body. No matter what I'm feeling on the physical realm, I know I can reach another place. No matter what I'm experiencing, what's going on, uh, that, that revelation and understanding of that I am not who I appear to be or how I'm feeling. I'm a reflection of what's being revealed and what God has already destined. So just being able to exercise that revelation and insight, it, it causes me to persevere and, and to keep going. I want to encourage you to, uh, there's one book, I just read a lot of different books. There, there's one book that I would recommend, The Ten Essentials of Highly Healthy People uh, by Walt uh, uh, Laura Moore. He's an MD. I would encourage you to, to get those books and other relevant texts, you know, that would help enhance uh, what we've talked about here today. That is a wonderful way to close us with some practical guidance and wisdom. Um, thank you so much. I want to especially thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Allison and Dr. Spears for being with us. I want to thank um, Pam Stampin and Norbert Wilson for bringing greetings on behalf of our fabulous partners with Church Mutual and Duke Divinity School, and in particular, I want to thank the Office of Black Church Studies for their support in making this work possible. And thank you to all of you, the participants, for attending. We know that you're setting aside time and space and energy to prioritize that work, and that alone is such an encouraging sign. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll get a follow-up email in the days ahead that'll include a link to a survey about today's event. We want to hear from you about what you learned, and we'll also post a recording of the webinar to both the Duke Divinity School website and Church Mutual's website with links for those of you who want to come back to watch it after the fact. If you found something in today's conversations helpful, we hope you'll share it with others. This is the way that we can help to do this work in community for one another. Thank you again for being with us today and blessings on the rest of your day.